I, I thought I should give a little bit of background. I mean, sort of this is a story that started some years before AlphaFold and continued at least one or two years after it. And it's a bit of a hint for the future also. But um, I will tell you a little bit what we have done, and well, not only we, but the field has done for the last years. But I'll start with a very short introduction of what a protein is. If this one works. Uh... No, yeah. So protein, as I'm sure most of you know, is a chain of amino acids. And uh, already 50 years ago, it was shown that, uh, or 70 years ago, it was, it was proposed that it could form what's called secondary structures. So Linus Pauling modeled it. They showed that you could form helices and sheets and some other structures also that are basically satisfying the hydrogen bonds of the, of the backbone of the, of the amino acid sequence. And then it was shown that it folds into a three-dimensional structure. And uh, that uh, has been shown that it's for most proteins, or at least for many proteins, this is this global free energy minimum. It's not always the case, but it's generally the assumption that most cases have that. And sometimes, as you can see here, it binds some kind, I think you can see mine, yes. You can see uh, it binds some other molecules, in this case a heme group, so it does a function. But then also, it also folds together with other proteins and form complexes. So this is uh, hemoglobin, and it consists of four chains. So there are proteins that consist of many chains, but there are so many, there are, so interaction between proteins is also important, not only proteins and things. But it's all governed by the same physical rules. So yeah, here we have this. And, uh, there were some traditional me methods to do the structure prediction. And the only thing that really worked until recently, until basically 2020, 2020, 2021, is that you use homology. So basically, the idea is that two proteins that have a common ancestor, they're homologous, actually, in most cases, have a very similar structures. So if you know the structure of one of them, you can use that to model the other one. And this applies both to single proteins, but also to Multiproteins. It's not always the case, things can change, but in general, that's the assumption. And many people spend years on improving these methods, and it based on improving the alignment of two sequences or the sequence and the structure, but also using parts of sequences like fragments and bringing bring things together, etc. So there was a lot of things that, are, that worked that. So that works for a quite large set of all proteins, but it doesn't really explain how proteins fold. So there were also people for many years have tried to fold proteins in using some kind of physics-based models, more or less detailed. But in basically, I, I think people end up doing it that you need to at least have an all-atom molecular dynamics model, including water. And you can actually fold small, fast-folded proteins this way. You can take something that's short, short of folds in milliseconds, put it in a supercomputer, and run it for a long time and get a good description of free energy landscape. But as you can see here, it's often, if, it's, if you don't have enough time, you can get stressed into local minima, it takes time, and there's a lot of physics to understand there. But that's, in theory, if the methods were good enough and had fast enough computers, we could simulate products like that. But it's, we are quite many orders of magnitude away from that yet. And it's not clear that the methods really are accurate enough to do that. So, uh, what people, what has worked, what started working some 10 years ago is the idea, uh, the idea is 30 years old, it's in the mid 90s. It's the idea that you can use evolutionary information because we assume in evolution that the structure is conserved. So the structure will have constraints on evolution also. So that means that if you have two residues that are in contact, like that residue and that residue, they could have an evolutionary pattern that's, that's sort of, if one changes, the other one should also change. So if you have a big amino acid and a small one, the big becomes small, the small one has to become big, so fill out the gap. So there, are, there should be co-evolutionary cool signals there. And this is, uh, was a couple of groups that did it in the mid-90s. It did not really work. I mean, it, it had some value, but it was not good enough for really predicting structure. But people used it as filters and so on. And it was even almost an abandoned field, because we had it as a, as, a, as, a, as a 
category in cash to produce contacts, but then basically it was abandoned because progress was so small. But then it's one thing that people realized, and it's actually realized in 99 by Lapidis, and there's also a couple of other papers about the same, 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 the same time, with the same idea. But that was sort of forgotten, because it didn't really, well, it probably worked, but probably the data was not there and people didn't read the papers. But the, the idea is basically that if you have, a, think about a protein like this, you have a native protein, it's well packed, and I mean, acids are nice together, this is a small part of it. And then for some reason there's a mutation. Mutation happens spontaneously. And that will of course somehow disrupt this uh, packing. So that will be unfavorable, but of course, if it's not too bad, the organism can still survive. But there's a tendency to have compensating mutations that are gonna happen. I mean, if you have compensating mutations, that's gonna be favorable. So there's gonna be a compensating mutation. So you first you mutate the pentamer to an arrow, and then you mutate the quadrat to a pentamer, and then it, it looks like the fact. However, if you look at the top here, look at this region here and this region here, they are not the same. So they're gonna be indirect interactions. So you're gonna have indirect couplings. And this is, means that if you have rest of I interact with B with J and J with X, then I and X are also gonna have contact. And because all, all residues in the protein are connected, this indirect coupling is gonna cause correlations that you don't pick up if you look at directly. But that was compensated for using, for instance, this direct coupling analysis. So you have indirect coupling and you can compensate for that. And that really changed the, the area of contact predictions. So the real, suddenly contact predictions become useful. So this was Martin White and others who did this in around 2008 started. And suddenly people um, uh, could model the structure of proteins. And uh, Debbie Marx and Chris Sanders and others pushed, to, I said, you can actually do it for quite a lot, a lot of proteins. However, so you, you, you do this list, you do something like this, you take a protein, you look at the contact map, so this is the sequence of the protein, the first, and this is the sequence. When, and whenever there is a gray dot there, there's a contact, so this is some contact here, down here. And then this is a method that predicts it, and in this case you predicted all the green ones, and you predicted the red that are correct, and you predicted a few extra ones. But you really can see here, that you can predict quite a lot, you missed the long one range of information here, but you missed the short ones, you can, you can pack, completely pack on these sheets together. However, um, you can also see that these contact patterns are clearly not random. It's not like a, a random distribution of, of, of Gaussian noise. There are patterns there. There are like diagonals. There are contacts that are close to each other because the structure has information about the contacts. And of course, patterns is something that machine learning is really good at detecting using. So we are, that is machine learning is good at recognizing patterns. If, if, so if we can see it, it will be quite easy to train uh, contacts. You're gonna have to think the simple thing. If you have one contact here and one contact here, it's likely to have diagonal along it. So you can think, look at things. You can easily see if you have a single contact at one point and nothing else around it, that's quite likely false positive. But if you, if, or either that or you have more contacts around it because you don't have single contacts hanging hang around. So we did this in 2014. Uh, it was our first attempt. So we were, this was our very naive deep learning methods for doing this. So we took two of these methods for predicting contacts, PLM, DCA, and SciCom, that are, I mean, the same idea, but there are different uh, mathematics behind them. And we use, also used four different multiple sequence alignments. And we, so we had eight, no, we had eight different multiple sequence alignments. Basically, you, you can use multiple sequence alignments, input here, you can use different cutoffs for the iteration, you can use different methods. We could use, and we, we tried to figure out what was the best method, and we figure out, as many other cases, that there's not only a single answer to that question. It depends from case to case. In some cases, you get better patterns using one. In some other cases, you get better patterns using another one. So we took this and uh, we added some information about secondary structure and surface, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a simple, this case was very simple. It was um, random forest to predict the context. Uh, but then we iterated. So we, could, we had a predict context and then we iterated here a number of times. And we showed that for each iteration, at least for five iterations, we could do better and better predictions. And so at the end, we could get from this noisy picture here on the top here, 
to something that actually has a quite good prediction value here down here. So for, from 18% to 56% correct pre context predicted. So in this case, at least it worked, but uh, uh, yeah, so we do that. And uh, we showed then we improved this method, we used more advanced machine learning methods, and we showed that this actually could help quite a lot. So this is the overall performance of like many years of work together. Uh, here, in the x-axis, we have the size of the multiple sequence alignment. The, 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 the problem with these early methods is that you needed quite big multiple sequence alignment. You needed thousand sequences. And in 2014 and so on, that was not for all families you had that, because the sequence was not. Nowadays, you basically have it for everything, because the sequence database is much bigger. But it was a problem. And, but, uh, and then we had some measure here. This is just, oh, sorry. Mm, just the number of correct predictions. If you do one prediction per residue, so you predict maybe half of the predicted context should be there. And you, you often needed something like 40, 50 percent there to make a good model. I mean, it was not exactly cut off, but at least it's a good measure to measure there. And if you look at this, is the DCA type methods. They are, I mean, there's a few different ones, and they are, you see that if you get over 1,000 sequences, they're getting quite good. But for small families, they're getting quite bad. The red line here is an old method, much earlier, that is based on machine learning. It doesn't use these this, uh, this, uh, indirect couplings. So it never reaches a very, very high performance. It reaches a performance of maybe 30%, 25%. 20, and that was state of the art, basically, before. But it's quite flat. It does it even for the small uh, multiple sequence alignments. So it's quite flat. For some reason, there are some hard ones here around the 1,000 that are more difficult. So everything is, has more problems there for some reason. And then we showed that we could, uh, by machine learning, bring basically combining these two types of information. It's not the same method, but anyway, we could basically improve it all over the track. So even for like things with the hundred sequences, we could actually do good predictions. Still, if it was less than hundred, the performance dropped quite quite rapidly. So that means that we could model things for most big protein families. So we developed a pipeline. Call it PCOMS fold. So basically, we took these sequences, we run number of multiple sequence alignments, we did secondary structure prediction. In this case, we used this third version of our PCOMS method. And we made a number of contact maps, we made a lot of structures, and, and, and the structure modeling in this case was just using uh, uh, CNS, which is, well, we call it, it was called CONFOLD, some hacked CNS, basically the same method as used for using NMR structure prediction. Understand it was just hacked a bit to add in this information. And we generated a pool of models here from this, because there are many different methods, and we had the protein structure at the end. And we applied this to all of PFAM. So PFAM is a family of, uh, um, uh, it's a database of protein domain families. So at that time, I think it was like 15,000 families in, in PFAM at those days, it's maybe 20 now. And uh, we took all these structures all, all the, I think, about 7,500 families that had no structure information. We couldn't model by homology. And we tried to predict it. So at the end, we ended up with 500. So it was not that many, but it was at least 500 new families we could model, give a structure to. At the same time, there was the Baker group did something similar, published more or less at the same time. Or slightly, uh, and they had an, also about the same number. The overlap was not that great because methods were identical. So in total, you can maybe do 700 model protests. So we had a bit of, uh, there was an overlap between our methods. So there was, at least there was some novel biology that could, could be predicted, but still, it was 500 out of 7,500, but still 7,000 missing. And the models were not atomistic quality either. There was a development, I guess the key paper here to, do, to, to describe is the Raptor X. It was the first, or, or maybe not the first, but the most successful of the more deep learning based content predictions. It's, it's based on the uh, same idea as we had done in other papers. So you take your sequence and uh, uh, you do this co evolutionary prediction. So using DCA, your PLM, DCA, some of these methods exist there. But you also do sec prediction for each residue. And the trick, to, then you get like, if you have a sequence of uh, L. You do n predictions. You can predict the secondary structure. You can predict the surface area. You can predict the whatever you want from it, basically, and, and the sequence itself. And if you take it, do an outer product 
of a vector L, you get an L by L matrix with a depth of n, or 3 times n. Uh, so, you, so you basically get a square matrix here also. It doesn't really mean anything, but it is something that the machine learning can learn from. And you do that, and you take the coevolution information that is already L, L square, which uh, in this case they use three different numbers, and you merge it together, and then you use basically techniques from image recognition. You use the co convolutional network, and you do predictions. In this case, they did it for the whole protein. So you can do it for a small part of the protein. doesn't really matter so much. But you do 2D convolutions, and basically so the input is something that represents contact, and the output is, is a new contact map. And this was in like 2017, 18. It was showing some progress. It was getting, I mean, it was clearly, I mean, there was a lot of interest in the field. It was not really replacing other methods, but it was there for the hard targets. We could do predictions that you couldn't do before, and at least with quite high accuracy. So it was really interesting. So I guess that is when DeepMind got interested in the field. And in CASP 13, when in 2018, suddenly DeepMind entered CASP. So CASP is our structured prediction contest every two years. And this is sort of like the plot I think I showed a couple of times, uh, where you have a measure here, which is called GTTS, which is basically quality. 100 is perfect, zero is random. About 90 is probably experimental methods, accuracy. So you have, it's not, it's nothing else. So if you take the two structures, the same structure and do two different experiments and compare them, you get 90. And then there is a measure of target difficulty, which is basically how similar is the most similar protein in the database. There's some other measures, but there's a rank that people used for many years. And CAS has been running since 1994. And this is just a straight line, but you could look at it. You see that for the easy targets, the methods has always been good, and at least it was uh, a pretty good improvement in the beginning, a small improvement, but it's been slightly better, but not a lot. <laughs> For the hard targets, it took 10 years maybe to jump from something very random to something better random, and then nothing happened for the next 10 years. And then suddenly, between CASP 11 and CASP 13, performance jumped quite significantly. And in particular, CASP 13, it was clear that uh, DeepMind's AlphaFold 1 method worked quite well. So you had uh, uh, some impressive predictions. This is you see the, well, either the blue or the green is the native model, native and the green is prediction, and they are quite similar and quite high accuracy than before. If you look at the contact maps, one side is the real contact map, and one is predicted one, and this is not contact, this is distances. So I, yellow is the shortest, and blue is the furthest, and then the dark is more than 20 angstrom away. So you have, they are very symmetrical, so you can see that the predictions were quite good. But still, it was not atomistic resolution. And it was not as good as you see. It's still quite far away from the best for the easiest target. And how did AlphaFold 1 do it? And uh, I will actually not tell you. I will tell you how TR, well, this is the, yeah, sorry, this is the same, same this is just another non-straight line fit. You see the jump here. Uh, and this is an example. It's like, you see, it's not perfect. This loop here is wrong, for instance. But, most of the backbone of is quite nice. Side chains are not perfectly packed in this case. So I will not tell you how uh, the AlphaFold 1 worked, but I will tell you how Tia Rosetta works, because well, I have a better slide for that. And it was released by Baking Group six months later. It's, and it's basically a copy. So uh, the key difference from what we've compared to Raptor X difference is actually that you do a prediction of distance bins, so you do, you do, instead of predicting contact, non-contact, you predict probability of a distance. So you have distance bins from zero to 20 angstrom, and you predict probability of each residue to be in that distance. The input is basically the same. It's the same input. You still use these DCA methods or other methods for predicting things that you then put into the network as an input. But the, and then in my theory set also use some angles. They're not that important, but anyway, that's what the, but the good thing about these distances is well, I think there's one other thing is that, uh, that they tell is important, is that this network here is much deeper. So the network used here, 
first they use another function which is a bit but particularly it's much deeper. So they do it for small, they will do it for a 64 by 64 block, not the whole protein. And that enables them to do it much deeper. And if you do it much deeper, you, you can learn much more advanced uh, information somehow. So they really said that the deepness is the important part. And that partly is because GPUs are better, you have more memory, but partly it's also DeepMind's experience in doing machine learning. But the idea is you have these distances, and you can actually turn these distances into potential. You can turn it, if you have a probability distance, you can say, oh, this is gonna have a peak at five angstrom, and it's gonna fall off, or it's gonna have two peaks, whatever, you can have some distances. You can, and this you can put into a simple minimization protocol. You don't need to have any fancy uh, Monte Carlo or distance geometry, you can do simple minimization in a fold, I mean, a lot of overlap, and you get a good model, and then you can do add side chains and relax it a little bit. So this method is actually much faster than the early methods. So you do a very quick method there. They tried other tools also, but they really didn't gain anything from, from it. So the, the, it was still, I would say, impressive. They were clearly better than the early methods, as you can see here. There was a jump in performance. And we jumped from there to there. But uh, it was basically just an extension of early work. So we sat there and realized, yeah, now suddenly deep learning works. We can use these methods. I mean, Alphafold 1 is not available, but Sierra Set was available, and there's some other people that implemented similar things also. So we thought that basically, and we did some work on it, showed that basically it, it works for almost everything we try it. Like everything in the big family. It's not I mean, fantastic accuracy, but it's good enough. So for instance, before we had problems with repeat proteins, you, had, you did repeat proteins, and that was a problem with the ZSA methods because you get patterns that were overlapping and didn't get good models, but these things just worked. You just put it in, you get a nice model. Uh, we had some problems where you really had interesting evolutionary information. You had a part of a protein that was missing three residues, in, or, or no, missing a plus membrane helix in the middle, which means that everything else has to turn around. And we could really check, we can run this, we get a perfect model of a new loop forming and everything turned around and it looks fantastic and there. it agrees with functional ideas of the protein. So you could really use it for some biology. But we said, next thing is protein-protein interactions. This is gonna be the things. So we started looking at that. The problem with protein-protein interactions from uh, this point of view is that you have two MSAs and you need to match them. It's not, you, you wanna look for co-evolution signals. So you need to know that exactly this line, this protein in, in M for, for protein A and this line for protein B are interacting. And if you have only one copy of each protein in each genome, it will be super easy. They always interact the same way. So if you have always that. But in particular in eukaryotes, you have many parallels, you have many copies. And it can be so that one protein interacts with all the other ones, or it's just that you have a particular one interact with another one, and it can change, and so on. Or in some circumstances, it interacts with the other one, et cetera, and so on. So that means that it's quite hard to find optimal matching there. And also, you will so what we do, and everybody else does nowadays, more or less, is that we just you know, we also take the first hit of each proteome. So we take the, we take protein A, we search all the proteomes, we take the top hit in each one, search B, take protein B, we search them, and take the top hit in one and put them together. That means that we throw away a lot of information, so the, the depth of the MSA is much smaller, but it seems to work. And uh, nowadays, we have a lot of sequences. For most cases, it works. So we did this, very simple principle. We took our MSAs. We merge these alignments, they shrink and become smaller. We used TR Rosetta, because that was what was available, make the contact predictions. So in this case, you can see one side here is the contact, real contact, and one side is the predicted contact. We used basically Rosetta also, Pi Rosetta, the same protocol as TR Rosetta, but I just hacked it a little bit to make two chains, uh, and made predictions. And we did scoring, and it, it, we found out the best scoring method we had was basically the simple, if you run this many times, if you always get the same answer, you were most likely correct. If you get a different answer, you're most likely wrong. So just looking at consensus between the, answer, between the methods was quite good. So we showed, it, there were cases where this worked. So that, uh, this is a perfect prediction that we could do. It's like it's 2.6 ohms, also quite nice. But unfortunately, it didn't work in every case. So here you can see we can only get like few contacts here that are actually might, well, they might be correct, but most of the contacts that should be there, we don't predict. So it worked in some cases, but not 
that's not at all. At least in CAST 13, we had used this and we made one prediction that was good that we used for this. That was the best one, but also one target, so we were not at all that good in overall, but at least it worked in one case. We also found out the same thing again that, like, so this is two different proteins here and here, and they're two different alignments. And in this case, this alignment works well. And in this case, this alignment works well, but not other ones. So you had to, we didn't know what was the best way to align. It was not one way to do it. We had to try different cases. We had to do many alignments. But because the scoring worked, we could do that. But still at the end, we end up with something like, uh, uh, as you see here, this is our quality. If you take the um, PCOS doc here, it's like the red ones. You see, you have some models that are good, but not so many. And if you compare to other methods, like old classical documents, we were more or less equally good or equally bad, I would say. They are like a few, an average score is basically close to zero. There are a few models in OEC methods that are good. And that's, I mean, this is excluding simple homology modeling that could be better if you included that. But if you include that, the only thing that was a bit nice that it's sort of a bit orthogonal, so we could at least be a bit, uh, add some information to it. But, I mean, it was a start, but it didn't really work. And then in CAS 14, we saw this. So suddenly, if you look at the hard targets, the, this GGTTS jumped from like, my, it was 40 in CAS, CAS 12, in CAS 13, it was close to 60, and now it was close to 90. So, and you can also say that the methods that didn't use AlphaFold 2 was basically catching up to AlphaFold 1. It was more or less equally good as AlphaFold 1 was a few years before. So of course, we had to figure out how it worked. I mean, yeah, this is also the target, the same one, plot again. Uh, CAS 13 was the red one here. And see, this is how it's CAS 14. It's almost a flat, flat line. So it's almost as good for the hard target as for the easy targets. And it's almost over 90 all the way. So it almost is as good as experimental methods. So it was extremely impressive. And of course, everybody was eager to find out how it worked. And if you look at the models, I think this is actually probably the most impressive plot. If you look at the RMSD, so the displacement of atoms, for 95% of the residues, you, ignore, you can always have some ends or flop and so on, but take 95% of the residues, all other methods have about three. This is below one. And one is, the, is basically the distance between two atoms. So it's, it's quite good. You, you can see that you have, e, I mean, sure, this loop here is not absolutely perfect, but like, this really, really follows exactly straight on. This sync binding site is perfect model with side chains. Even this big protein is it's not one angstrom, but it's, it's, it's much, much bigger protein than anybody could do with this metals before. And uh, it's 2.2 .2 angstrom, James 0.96. See how short, sure, some, some shifts here, but basically it works. And it even works for some proteins with very few sequences, but they, I mean, they worked hard on that, but it, it sort of did. So what, how does AlphaFold work? This is, uh, this took, I mean, luckily, the paper written and the code is available so people can understand it completely. And, but, but of course, there was Min Klong Beck and the people in Baker Lab sort of managed to copy most of it from the presentation. So they, they could figure it out, but it was not really everything, but most of the things there. But if the, the description is good enough, and particularly the code is there, so everybody can look at it and do it. That's thanks to the open source initiatives. So the first thing you can think about, it threw away everything done before. It really tr tried to not build an Apple one at all. It's a completely new start. Of course, every, almost every single uh, part of it has been proposed somewhere else before. It's not like, not everything is invented from scratch, but there are, so there are papers describing different things and doing different things, but and most of it in computer science literature, but not all, and then, but of course bringing it together is, is the key thing here. So it starts with an MSA. It has a, a way of using templates, we can ignore that for the moment, because that just doesn't really matter actually, to be honest. It, it just makes the prediction slightly easier, but it uses MSA, but it doesn't do any of this DCA or this coevolution calculation. It uses the MSA directly. And then it also has some, a parapresentation, and then it has what they call the EVA formers. The EVA formers is a transformer-based model. I will show you more in the next slide. And it does this 48 times. So basically, that, that iterates between the MSA and the parapresentation. And then uh, it outputs a parapresentation, which is basically distances between every pairs. 
and it has a structure module. To be honest, you could cut away the structure module and you do almost as good. You could put that into the old, old method and it works quite fine, but the structure module is actually faster and slightly better. You can also do a recycling. In, uh, it helps for difficult cases. So it's not, it's not absolutely necessary. For, for the easy case, if you clear signal, you don't need it. But for the hard case, when the signal is not very clear, it helps. So there are, but that's, the, that's uh, I will not ignore talking about that, but it's really, the key thing is this evil former. Well, first, key, key, first key, key thing is this MSA input. So people had done that before. There was at least two papers that had done it before, but not very successfully. I mean, they were okay, but not improving performance. Basically, you, you do the same thing, but instead of having, uh, Instead of having this co-evolution thing, you just do an you, you do an embedding of the MSA and you predict contact map. So this is actually the wrong slide, but yeah, it's uh, so instead of using this co-evolution, you can put in MSA directly. So the even form does that. Uh, so it has MSA, and then it uses the transformers uses a trick that's called attention, which basically tells you this is the important part that you learn what is important. It does it both on the columns, that represent the position in the sequence, and on the rows, which represent the sequence. Which is sort of useful, because they actually did with training, they put in some noise, they put in some bad MSAs also sometimes, so it learns to ignore the bad parts. So that was a trick that people realized afterwards when people really tried to retrain it, they did not do that, and they then behaved differently. And it still works for cases, but it's, it's more sensitive to adding bad things in it. You do this, you basically let the network learn that this is the important positions for things that are very far away from each other in structure, not that important because you have no signal, but things that are as close are, are signals. And so on. So you sort of learn co-evolution signals. You take your MSA then, you do an outer product mean, you get a parallel representation. And then you do the same thing here, that you sort of, okay, what, what content is important? And here you use what you call a triangle update. So you use basically every triangle of points are also important. So I and J and J and K are important. And then you keep on doing that. And you get some kind of parameter. Of course, this is a hyperdimensional space. You have no idea what it means, but it means something with distances. And, that, and you do this 48 times, with independent weight for each, each layer. So you, you really sort of iterate and learn more and more. You can learn more and more advanced things. And of course, the benchmarks from less than 48 times worked well, less well. So you get a very good representation of every paramount distance. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. The structure module then takes these distances, paramount, uh, uses basically treats the protein, I think this is probably, treats the protein as, as a gas phase. It tells that every, every, every residue is a triangle with the orientation, and they have a way to, to do this with, without having, uh, uh, being equivalent, so it doesn't matter if you have it rotated or so on. And then you basically optimize the correlation of all the perfect the backbone. You don't even need to know that the rest of are corrected, because you know all the rest of i and i plus one are going to be next to each other, so you don't have to tell it that, it learns it. And then afterwards, it also predicts the side chain confirmations and packs the protein. And at the end, it has a refinement protocol you can use if you want to. Okay, I should go on a bit, um, otherwise we will not have time. So, the, yeah, well, Alpha Fold was released in summer 2020, 2021, it was the middle of the pandemic, everybody was starting working on it. So it was like, Twitter was full of discussions, and it was, it was a nice way to spend the summer. And uh, was, anyway, this is from a community paper showing just something that was basically done in the first two months. I mean, it took a longer time to get it published, but it was the first two months. and. Uh, People did different things just running it. You can use a lot of different things. It basically shows you that the models are almost as good as crystal structures. That's, and it can be used for predicting disorder and other things also. This is just a set of papers. That have, I'm a small set of all papers that have used this for the other things. We did, we went back to our, our work on interactions. Basically took the same thing as we did in Theoroseta, but just replaced Theoroseta with other fold. We took our sequences. We combine them and say we run our fault. And it was also probably Ming Kyung Beck who should, uh, and some others that showed you that you could do this on Twitter. And then like we just told them, because it's a trick in our fault that you actually have a residue number. So if you have a residue number 55 and you then just have another residue number 155, that's, then it thinks it's gonna be, it's like a chain, chain break. So you can just add the chain to the residue numbers and, and, and you have the whole 
it features two chains. And remember one thing here, when we do this, this AlphaFold 2.0, it has never ever seen two chains together. It's only seen in single chains. We did these MSAs. You can actually take MSAs, just merge them together, and you get something like that. Because sometimes you have MSAs that covers both proteins anyway, because they are suffused couples, so you have some bad MSAs. Sometimes you do that. You can do the pairing as we did before. You can do what we call the block. So basically, you take just put MSA1 and MSA2, and then you put the gaps in between them on the other side. And you can combine these things together. And in, in this example here, this one did not work very well. This one either, this combined one worked in this case. So we tried all these things, and if you remember, we had some plot before where you had like, that looked like, more like, like this one. You had a few good models, but most were bad. So this is the docq score, it's like 0.23 is a good cutoff for a good model. And it's using Rosetta Fold, uh, yeah, nothing that's really worked. Just yeah, take Alpha Fold 2 straight of the box. We got this plot here, which is like, we suddenly have a few models that are really good. I mean, there are many models that are, maybe, maybe one quarter models or something are better than, than our uh, established cut of a good one. We use the pairing to do a bit better. If you combine the pairing and the original one, and also with the top ranked one, it is better and better. So then we end up with like 60% of the models that are over a cutoff. And this is, this is compared to anything else before, it's way ahead of it. We showed that still coevolution is probably important because we use the coevolution method to predict here. And we say in the cases where we have no context in the coevolution, and these are docu scores, it's called our predictions, basically all models are bad. Not all, there are a few good ones, but most of them are bad. Well, if you have content in the middle, they are about half good, but if you, this is another alignment, so you get. So basically, there still is a co-evolution signal that's probably important for most cases. And these are some examples. I mean, the packing is perfect in these cases. I mean, this, this side chain is slightly off, but this is probably up to the surface. So it's really completely different quality than what anybody could do before. We also showed you that you can make a score. So we can basically just take, in this case, we took a very, very simple function. We just looked at the interface, counted the number of contacts, and took the predicted quality of this interface. Because one good thing with AlphaFold is that it actually, it's not only making good models, it also estimates how good it is, which is an important factor. It has a two measurements, one overall, and one for each rest you do. It's called a PLDT value. And that is, a, it's really good at that, and that's important. We just say, if we put those things together, but they are badly predicted, we ignore it. But if, and if you don't put them together, we, we don't think it's a good model. So we, and then we just fit this simple curve to it. It's perfect, but it at least is, it's quite good. And we showed that this measure could go separate good and bad models. Not so surprising, because that we did. It has an error on the curve of like 0.95. And we can also be used to predicting interacting and non-interacting proteins from our data sets. So not as good, because there are some that we probably miss. But at least it's better than other methods to do that. Which means that we could take this, we can actually, this we can skip for the moment. We can take this on large data sets. So we took two data sets. One, URI, which is a yeast to hybrid data set, which is basically people try to ask to interact, and there's like 65,000 interactions. And one from a cool purification data set from Ed Marcotte and colleagues, which is called UMAP. And then we run this and we estimated, uh, estimated these PDOQ values. We remember like somewhere, if you're more than 0 0.3, 0 0.4, you, you have a good one. If you're less, you, have a, you don't know a good principle. So we look at these red curves. That's basically the subset of these data sets where we have some additional evidence. Either you have a structure module, or we have extra cross-linking data, or in, in extra additional to hybrid experiments. And in all of these cases, we have about 60% of the models are good and 40% are bad, which is, agrees with what we see in PDB. If you take the random data set, which is these blue ones here, we basically have everything has good, has, uh, has bad scores. So basically, we don't, for random proteins, we don't get, predict any interactions. There are a few, few ones up here. If you take the UMAP data set, it's not as high as the red one, but it clearly is a bump up here. Uh, while in the Euro data set, this bump is very, very small. So in the yeast to hybrid data set, we can hardly predict any of the contexts that are, should be there, but in UMAP, it predicts mm, quite many of these. And why is that the case? Well, first we can say we can improve the data set with high quality predictions, more than was done before. So you can basically get three times more than you could do by structure. Let's skip this. 
So we can see that uh, one reason why we can't do as well in UMAP is because uh, we are all pro we can only see things that are directly interacting. So if we have a complex of six proteins and not directly interacting, we can't detect it. We can only detect it directly interacting pairs. So that's uh, uh, so that and if you do that in the data set, we get something similar. We get basically that curve set, which is sort of a similar size. But and uh, yeah, this is another data set we show the same thing. Um, but the, 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 we showed that this jury data set has a lot more disorder. So it contains many more So, so that most likely these are transient interactions. I mean, it can be noise also, but it, it contains many more transient interactions. And it means that we can't detect transient interactions, probably. I can't say if they are, if they are just noise, if they are there, but we can't detect them. They're not part of stable complexes in the same way. So that's a drawback of a manifold. We can't predict transient interactions. And of course, they have small MSAs, but that's because they're disordered. I skipped it. But anyway, we could do that. We could create interaction networks. If you look at this network, you get some interesting points. You can look at this one. This is the proteasome. And here we have a network of basically everything interacting with everything. And you can look at this one here, which is the uh, RAB GDI interactions. Then only it's a very different picture. It's GDI one interacting with all these RAB proteins. If you look at the structure of this, you have the GDI protein and the RAB protein, and all the RAB proteins look the same and bind in the same place. So that means that this is competitive binding. They can't bind all at the same time because they're overlapping. In contrast, in the proteasome, it's a part of a big complex. So if you analyze these networks, you can, get, you can learn more things about it. Of course, this was already known in these cases, but we could do that. And the interesting thing we did is like we could actually see that we could build this proteasome by taking subunits by subunits. We took one subunit, which are two pairs, and I added the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. The problem was that we had to do it in the right order. It didn't work if you just took every random pair, because they, they all look the same, and then it's got sort of overlapping, some models were correct, some were pretty wrong, and so on. So if you did the right order, it worked. But then, uh, okay, I guess, uh, yeah, the, we used the uh, Monte Carlo tree sort method that, uh, basically does searches all possible orders and do that in different orders and, and basically tries to expand as long as you can for each order. If you do that, you can end up with having a large set, or not all, but like one, 10, 15% of these very, very big protein complexes that we could predict with high accuracy. So in this case, and you see they are mainly, I think I have a slide not here. You see they are mainly symmetrical. So if there are, if there are some symmetry in them, we can, we can get good answers. For the ones, asymmetrical ones, we are only have one that is okay. The rest are, are quite bad. So for symmetrical wings, you can just start building up here there. And there's been some other groups doing similar things later with even higher accuracy than we have. Okay, I think that was a good time for you having some questions. So. <laughs>